Welcome viewers to Focus, coming to you from here in the Burlington studio, Burlington, Vermont studio. We are Channel 17, Center for Media and Democracy. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington of Focus. And viewers, today we have a delightful visitor with us. It is the poet, Greg Delante. Welcome, Greg Delante. Welcome Thank you. to the studio here Lovely, in, in, in Burlington. Back, back again. Yes, back again. And uh, you're, Greg, you live right here in Burlington, Vermont. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the, the latest volume of your poetry called Selected Delante. <laughs> yes. And with a, uh, so it, it has poems from the last 30 years of your, of your working life. Yes, how many years? 30, 30 years, isn't it? 40, really. 40 years, oh Six. my Six. Uh, yeah, you're right. Thirty, but there was it could, you know there was poems before that as well, included in it when I was younger, like in my early twenties. So uh -huh. it goes back nearly forty years. Yeah, and then you have uh, they were chosen and introduced by Archie Burnett. That's right. Archie and is a great character, like great, great very, very respected. He, he did um, Houseman's collected and Philip Larkin's complete, and he's doing Elliot at the moment. And I say. He's putting me on stilts. I'm like a fellow on stilts, because he did. He 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 was the person that did them, and I'm delighted about uh, and honoured that he did them, and 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 the publishers did a beautiful job, Lisa and Julie, of Unjive. I mean, it's a beautiful looking book. Yes. It is inexpensive. For, uh, it's only two, nearly 300 pages, and it's only 19 dollars. And beautiful paper and the cover, everything is so gorgeous. Here it is. Um, and I got it at the uh, Phoenix Bookstore here yeah, in Burlington. Yeah. I mean, I, my dad was a printer and would read some of those poems, but um, it, it's, you know, uh, uh, sometimes, well, actually, in all poems, how they look on the page, how they are placed on the page, the type of print and the space they're given on the page makes a difference uh, to reading a poem. Sometimes if type is too small and stuff, it just shuts you out. But this is, I think, rather perfect for for my poems, at yes. least, anyway. And most of all, the reader wants to be welcomed in, welcomed Absolutely. into the poem. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, Greg, you're you're an immigrant from Ireland, from the County Cork, actually. Yeah, yeah. And you've been here. You've been poet in residence at St. Michael's College for thirty years. And could you start off this short time that we have with you with some of the immigrant poems? Sure. Um, well, I came here in 1986, uh, and I got a job at St. Michael's College in 1987. But when I came here, first I was on a fellowship, a kind of a, an award I got, just a travel around the United States. <coughs> but I arrived in New York, and I met friends of mine, uh, all lifeguards. We used to lifeguard in the Kerry beaches. And um, so we, he was staying in the Bronx, where all the Irish generally mm -hmm. were staying. So we did the pubs, you know. Yeah. And this poem kind of came out of that. There is a, an Irish myth, myth, myth uh, folklore of uh, the boards fighting for who's going to be the king. And of course, everybody figured it would be the eagle. But a little wren, a small little board, um, you don't have them in Vermont, um, a tiny board, got on the back of the wren and was so light that the, the eagle didn't realize it. And when the eagle flew as high as he could, the little bird flew up and he became uh, off off the back of the e eagle and he became the king of the birds. Now, that's just an analogy because America, the eagle and so forth. But there's other tie-ins as well because my father worked in the Eagle Printing Company and uh, and I'll connect that a little bit later with one or maybe one of the poems. Yes, but this is the poem at least. Okay. In the Land of the Eagle. Our first night here, we pub crawled the Bronx, still too new for us not to be enthralled by the street life and brew of all-night watering holes with names like the Shamrock or Galway Shawl, full of legals and illegals longing to go back, lowering pint after pint of their staggering Irishness, slaunting the dub's winning point cursing American Guinness. After that country for old men abandoned them, like the gannet abandons its fledgling, not all of them make it. Those that do are more 
like the wren who flew high of the eagle of folklore prevailing in the contentious sky. Beautiful. Paints quite a picture of yeah. immigrants. Well, I mean, it's, you know, um, I mean, America is a country of immigrants, except for the poor Native Americans or First Nations. Um, and that we, we kind of wiped them, we did a lot of harm to them. I, I won't say too much about that, but, um, but m the rest of America are immigrants. And so even if you're not Irish, it, this poem works. In fact, in, in a way, anyway, metaphorically, it, 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 we're all immigrants or immigrants in life. Uh, we're all trying to get home somewhere, you know, in a spiritual kind of s state. So in, in the end, it's, they're all, those set in the particular are about things that we all experience in one way or another. That's a, that's a theme that runs through your poetry too, the theme of home, where is home? Yes, um, yeah, yeah. The, um, you know, of course, there's no answer really. Um, home is, uh, I suppose, sometimes it's with friends who you can be completely comfortable with and say what you want to say. Other times it's a place. I mean, Vermont is my home now. Burlington is I love. I love that. I love having a lovely house here and so on and so forth. And um, and it's beautiful here. And politically, it's much better than most any other place. Uh, um, and and St. Michael's have been really good to me, and I love it there. And it's a nice community, and it does its best. And um, and Burlington has lovely bars and restaurants, and it's so close. And I can walk down, and I cycle everywhere. Mm. Uh, I have no car. I cycle to school as well. And we really get to know you through this, this, yeah. uh, these poems. Yeah. And what about your father, who was a compositor? So, uh, if you could go on to some of the yeah, poems sure. About him. Um, my dad, uh, he died in 1984, um, but he was a compositor, and, and most young people will have a clue of what a compositor is. I don't mind you. I like occasionally to call in. There's a little shop here on North Ave. And I like, he still sets tight there mm -hmm. at the star. Yeah. Uh, and I like to call in there, but smell the ink and, the, and, the, and so forth. But this poem was, was originally set off. I went into the, the printing office at St. Michael's and uh, one of the guys working there was chatting to me and I, I love the smell of this print and the ink. And it brought back me as a child being around the, um, being around the, 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 the composing room is what yes. it was called. And they had all these terms like the hell box where you throw broken of one type, which in itself, and then melt it down and recast into new type, which itself becomes a metaphor ultimately for us all recasting or melting down ourselves and recasting ourselves and making ourselves anew and also for the melting pot of America. Mm -hmm. So it, it had a multi layers as it were. So the first poem anyway came from just going, in, it was set off by um, going into the printing shop in Burlington, in uh, St. Michael's. Mm. A lot of, lot of terms in, um, which we don't realize in, in our language come from printing, like I'm out of sorts, which of course the sort is an asterisk and other kind of signs okay. in, in printing and the printer would say I'm out of sorts. So that actually comes into the language straight out of printing. Mm -hmm. Or another one, uh, mind your P's and Q's because when they were setting the type, it was upside down and back to front. And so it's easy to get P's and Q's mixed up. Right, right. And so forth. A lot of, a lot of these terms. But there's more of an origin to that. I read here in your, in your, in your volume that the P, it, it meant also pints and quarts. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, well, because the printers <laughs> were supposed to drink a lot. In right. fact, actually, you know, apparently because originally way back um, 400 years ago, whenever around the time printing was discovered, um, <laughs> they used to get a because the metal in the air and stuff they were making it with uh, the, the type and dealing with the type there was a lot of stuff in the air that was not good for, so they get up used to be given a pint mm -hmm. a or, 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 or alcohol so much by at the end of the day so that they could slake their thirst okay. but it became a kind of um, you know like like some trades it become a, a way of life my father liked to drink um, and I like to drink and I still drink and I can still drink a lot of people can't anymore. But anyway, the compositor. All the terms are printing terms, but they should ring through in some way. 
perhaps it's the smell of printing ink, sets me off out of memory's jumbled font. Or maybe it's the printer's lingo, as he relates how phrases came about. How, for instance, mind your P's and Q's, has as much to do with pints and quarts and the printer's renown for drink as it has to do with those descenders. But I don't say anything about how I discovered where widows and offerings or out of sorts came from the day my father unnoticed and unexpectedly set 30 on the bottom of his compositor's page and left me mystified about the origins of that end, how to measure a line gauge and how, since he was forced to go, he slowly and with out a word turned from himself into everyone as we turn into that last zero before finally passing on to the stone man. That's a marvelous poem. Yeah. It's a deep Thank poem. You. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of held off perhaps by the language and so forth, but. No. Um, by the depth of feeling that went into the, your composing it. Yeah, yourself. yeah. I, and as you know, some of the poems are humorous, you know. Uh, I mean, there is a range of humor and techniques all through the book. Yeah. Um, but I, I often think, uh, when I'm going to read a humorous one here, but humor, as um, I hope I can remember this now, but as um, Byron, the great Irishman Byron, <laughs> <laughs> um, said, uh, if I laugh at any mortal thing, it is that I will not weep. No, no. Mm. Is, that, is, that the, is that the right? I, I laugh that I'm not weep. No, no. I if, laugh if, that if, I'm not if, No, no. If, uh, if I, so I shouldn't go into this now, but <laughs> we're getting, so I shouldn't quote in Byron. But if I laugh at any mortal thing, it is that I may not weep. Is that yes, correct? Yes, yes. Um, so there you are. So will you m m m read a funny one, Strike Dink, and then another funny one. Okay. Um, Strike Dink is not a printing one. And I, when I was working in the printing compositor's floor, you know, there, there was a trick that the guys would play on you. And the printers, apprentices, so they'd send me down for a tin of Strike Dink. It like, it's like the, sending in a, in a construction work down for uh, a young fella down for a glass hammer. Okay. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah, and, I and I fell for it. Uh, and the, <laughs> the, the two printers here, composit compositors or apprentices, they, they, that's also a word for devil in printing. Oh. So there's a lot of tie-ups here. There's more of it, but I won't go into it, you know. Okay. But I'll read that here anyway. Okay. Striped ink. I'm smack dab in the old tabla rasa days, bamboozled by the books, adults bow over. Musing if their eyes light upon the white or black spaces. A boyhood later, still rain small on the top story of the Eagle Printing Company. I see books pour out and believe that if I fish in them, I'll catch the salmon of knowledge, tall tale to us at school, out of the river of wards. And like Fionn, I'll taste my burning hand, and abracadabra, I'll fathom what's below the surface. But if I'm burnt, it's later that day, on my first day as page boy, spaced from fixing leads. The devils, Fred and Dommy, types up a new book, dispatch me down to Christy Collin on the box floor for a thin of striped ink. I take the bait and watch floors of labouring women and men flit by, caught in the lift's mesh of X's, drowned out by the machine's hullabaloo. Somehow, between floors, <laughs> uh, the elevator conks out, the warning light winking, and I'm stuck on my message and still have no inkling. <laughs> I love that. That's very playful yeah. and evocative of of uh, times past with even the elevator. Yeah, the old, you know, the the old festival, yes. yeah, yeah, I remember those. And uh, uh, I mean, and also allusions to, again, there, if you notice, the wren 
um, and the eagle because he worked in the Eagle printing company yes. and, 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 and other mythologies, you know, in, uh, from Ireland. But um, can I read um, uh, yes. a poem to my son, which I would love kind that. of popular, yes. really? Yes. Since I read one from my father, and then I'll read one from my mother, maybe. Um, and then maybe we'll get one or two other ones in if there's time. Oh, no. um, the alien. Yes, I see that. The shape of birth. Okay. Um, this is to a child in a ultrasound, seeing the photograph and so forth. I mean, he's 16 now. He's a lovely boy. Mm -hmm. But um, the alien. I'm back again scrutinizing the Milky Way of your ultrasound, scanning the dark matter, the nothingness, that now the head say is chock-a-block with quarks and squarks, gravitons and gravitini, photons and fortinos, or sprout who art there inside the spacecraft of your ma, the time capsule of this printout, hurling and whirling towards us. It's all daft on this earth, or alien who art in the heavens, or Martian, or little green man. We're anxious to make contact, to ask diverse questions about the heavendom you hail from to discuss the whole shebang of the beginning and end, the pre-Big Bang on time, before you forget the why and lie of thy first place. And, our oh friend, to say welcome, that we mean no harm, we'd die for you even, that we pray you're not here to subdue us, that we'd put away or ray guns, missiles, attitude, and share our world with you, little big head, if only you stay. So beautiful. Um, what would you like me, it, will I do a poem well, in Irish maybe perhaps? Or? Yes, well, Will I read the one of your translations? Well, why don't you write, read one of your poems to your mother or about your mother? Right. Now, since you're, you're in your family now. Yeah, yeah. So they're all. Yeah. There's actually three books within there. I mean, they're all taken from different books. But th I always think of the three books. One is the Hell Box, uh, which is the world of m my father and the male. The second is the Blind Stitch, which is the world of the female, my mother and wife and f child and baby and so forth. And the third. Um, is um, the world of the child, the chip of birth. So I always think of them as a kind of a trilogy. It wasn't meant like that, but it, 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 it turned out like that, you know. Um, but there are poems, other, other poems within them, um, and in the political poems and so forth. This poem, um, uh, I had one of the jobs of reading, uh, oh, sorry, you know, when, when you were a kid, um, you were asked to do certain chores. One of my little chores was that I had to thread the needle for my mother when she was sewing because she, her eyes weren't great and my brother's and my father's eyes were also not great. No, mine aren't so great either, but um, uh, that was my job. And, and, uh, and so this poem comes out of that. There's a number of things in it. Um, the Rag and Bone Man. Well, we did have a Rag and Bone Man come to the park where I lived, uh, in Sleemish Park it was called. It was, so Bavarba in the state on the outskirts of Cork City and the ragman the brag and bow man will come around around and you get you bring clothes to him and and it, be, previous to that you'd bring bones and so forth and they'd be melted down and glue would be made and so forth out of that but the, now the, the, it was only, uh, my time when I was a child was just rags but he was still called a rag and bone man so there, you know there's a lot of things in this I did I wasn't particularly good at school um, so it's it's mentioned here, and Amadon means fool. So, mm. and um, there you are. A funny story I'll tell you after I read this. Okay. To my mother, Eileen, I'm treading the eye of the needle for you again. That is 
my specially appointed task, my gift that you gave me. Ma, watch me slip this camel of wards through. Yes, rich we are still, even if your needlework has long since gone with the rag and bone man, and da never came home one day, or dan. Work, 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 lose yourself in work. That's what he'd say. Okay, okay. Ma, listen, I can hear the sticks of our fire spit like corn turning into popcorn with the brown insides of rotten teeth. We sit in our old sleeve-mish house. Norman is just born. He's in the pen. I raise the needle to the light and lick the thread to stiffen the limp wards. I peer through the eye, focus, put everything out of my head. I shut my right eye and thread. I'm important now, a likely lad, instead of the Amadon at dread school. I have the eye, haven't I? The knack? I'm Prince Threather. <laughs> I missed it, that right. Concentrate, concentrate. Enough yakety yak. There, there, ma. Look, here's the threaded needle back. So, so tell me what, what the, with the funny, funny story was. <laughs> Mammy was, my mother was still alive. <laughs> and uh, my mother was a bit embarrassed about me. Well, uh, certainly to start about me writing poems, what, like, what would I do in my life and so forth. I mean, rightfully so, but there was huge battles in the house and I told her I was, I didn't even just say I was going to be a poet when I was 17, I said I was going to be a great poet. I mean, you have to be a bit arrogant when you're young <laughs> to get through a lot of the things. Um, and even now, perhaps. Uh, but uh, she, 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 when I, she, I don't know how she saw the poem. Uh, maybe she saw it published somewhere, I don't remember. But or it did appear in a later book called The Blind Stitch. And she said, she told my brother, she says, what's that poem about? Like, oh. <laughs> She says, what's she saying about, what's he saying about us? Or when I said uh, uh, with the brown insides of rotten teeth, is he saying we have rotten teeth? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and he knew more, but told me this afterwards, it was my brother, you know what I mean? <laughs> we were laughing about it, but um, and in the end she was proud, uh, glad, um, I think, you know, she, she couldn't do much about it anyway, <laughs> she knew that, but she was, um, she, she lived up to about 10 years ago, and uh, she saw, I mean, she saw me develop into, make your life out of it, you know, and she was pleased at that. It's wonderful in this poem how you bring us back to that moment, that you're looking in this time back to that time. Yeah. And you evoke yeah. it so beautifully. Well, it's also a poem about writing, of course, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. she, you know, I, I mean, I suppose it, it, it's a kind of subtext in the sense that my mother didn't really believe in poetry and didn't really read it and so forth, but she was very happy in the end that I did manage it, it seems. Mm -hmm. um, and she was just worried about money and how I'd make a living and right, right. And, and naturally if, if Dan, my son, did the same, I'd be worried about him too. But mm -hmm. I, I was lucky and I managed to make the best of my luck and also the work I did and so a lot of things have to come together. Right, but right. I've been very fortunate. And in you you have many translations in here too. Yeah, yeah. But both are they the Greek the Greek plays the Orestes? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. then the Irish, the Sean O'Riordan, right? Yeah, Sean O'Riordan. There's a lot of Sean O'Riordan. Um, would you like I to read know, one of those? I would actually like to read one of my friends, Liam O'Mirhla, um, if that would be okay. Of course, let's. Um, and Liam's is. Um, okay. Liam is sick at the moment. Um, very ill, and he's closest, probably, perhaps my closest friend in Ireland, and mm. great friend, and we grew up in the same, well, same school, same side of the city, mm. uh, and we, you know, he writes in Irish, I write in English, so we're like the two wings of perhaps uh, 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 Pegasus mm. in Ireland, like it's twin languages, oh. um, and um, so he's a dear friend, and uh, so he's a confidant as well. So I just want to think of him now. And when this comes up, I'll send him the link even. Yes. Um, but he's a, he came and read at St. Michael's a few times. And, he, and um, uh, a great a great post, really. Um, okay. But Does he write in Irish? Yes. Okay. 
Um, excuse me now. Here we go. It's called, uh, it's just, it's a, uh, what is it? It's a simple poem, really, but simple, but more to it than just being simple. Mm. What is it? I go from room to room around the house looking for something. And to be honest, I, I won't know what it is till I find it. It's not the bread tin, nor the coarse brown flour, nor the fine white flour. Though I take them out and measure them on the scales and bake a single loaf. It's not any book I was devouring, if memory serves me correctly. While I put down absent-mindedly, although I stand at the shelves and scan the book stacks and fall to my knees. It's not any missing key. I wasn't going out. I didn't leave anything on, although I'm shuffling from room to room, combing the whole house for something, and it's nothing, quietly mourning. Mm -hmm. I misread a line there, actually, which I put down, I should have said which, but. Do you want to read it over again? I would mind? love yes, to, if you don't mind, please. What it is. I go from room to room around the house looking for something. And to be honest, I won't know what it is till I find it. It's not the bread tin, nor the coarse brown flour, nor the fine white flour. Though I take them out and measure them on the scales and bake a single loaf. It's not any book I was devouring, if memory serves me correctly, which I put down absent-mindedly, although I stand at the shelves and scan the book stacks and fall to my knees. It's not any missing key. I wasn't going out. I didn't leave anything on, although I'm shuffling from room to room, combing the whole house for something, and it's nothing, quietly mourning. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh. That's Liam O'Mehrle, uh, my great friend. Um, yeah, there, there are translations which spread through the book from Aristophanes and Euripides to uh, a modern Greek poet who lives in Crete, uh, sorry, lives in um, Cyprus. Um, Kyriakos Hare Lembidis, and then uh, poems from the Gaelic from Oriadon and uh, other mm. and more contemporary poets. But through through the through the book, you know, um, yes, as yes. part of the work, I suppose, in a certain way of the of my um, of my um, world. I yes, your world and and the themes and. Uh, are also from in the Greek plays too, right? The mother-son relationships. In oh yeah, your absolutely. Poems in English. Absolutely. There's a lot of tie-in, even with uh, even. I'm going to finish up with a poem. A little, I don't know when we're to finish, but mentioning um, Euripides is. I translated the play, the Orestes, which I wanted to call humankind, or um, the family, mm -hmm. but it, it's it. It's a part of that translation is in this, and then it's referenced really in the last one of the last poems in the book. Mm -hmm. um, but you wouldn't know that. I mean, you can you can read either without knowing e e either of right. them. But yes. there's a lot of that going on in the book as well. There's yes. interplay between poems, also um, allusions and references, and and uh, sometimes playfulness. You know. Yeah. Well. As you said, you can read the poem by itself without getting all the connections. Yeah. But also reading the whole volume, it's it's a joy to find the connections sure. throughout and the themes throughout your your decades of writing. Yeah. But I mean, I, I've tried to hide in my writing. I've tried to hide the cleverness and the kind of tricks and uh, mm. and so forth. Um, I don't. I don't really like. There's some contemporary poets. I won't name them. Um, but they're all very clever on the top, but it's not, they, they're too dazzling and you can't, there's nothing that much underneath it. And if there is, you can't, you're too offset by it. So I, I rather hide the things and keep the cleverness inside. I mean, there, there's things like palindromes and everything in this, yeah. in this book. But that, that's for somebody who 
perhaps a critic or not to find in those mm -hmm. things, you know, but there are other meanings in the book that are hidden. Um, and that's the way I would like them. Frost did, did that in a different way. I mean, Frost hid a lot of his more deeper and disturbing uh, mm -hmm. world. I mean, uh, there's the great, uh, what is it? Um, Stopping by Woods in a Snowy Evening, which of course everybody thought was a lovely little bucolic poem, and of course it was a poem about suicide, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and it came out later on. I mean, but, uh, you know, so that's, I'm in the right place f for that kind of an influence. Uh, and um, well, well, the thing is that you let the reader in. You invite us in yes, so that yeah, we, yeah. Can, we can join you in the poem, so that yeah, yeah, you yeah. don't put up barriers to no, us. No, I actually tried so. to break the ink barrier. <laughs> That's the way you always term. Actually, Seamus used to like me saying that, that term, um, that, the, that the poem will break the ink barrier where you realize that it's not a poem anymore, but it's a spirit or something behind it, and you've forgotten the ink, and it's inside in you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that comes true, even the quality of a book, the type of a book, but also the poems themselves, if they're, if they're worthwhile, will do that mm -hmm. um, in their kind of spirit life, for want of a word, you know? I love that. And would you read the sock mystery now? Oh, sure. Um, this is in the, in the part of the book, uh, Uncollected Poems. Yeah, these are poems I never put in books, you know, yeah. for one reason or another. Um, they just didn't fit her, you know, a poem. I mean, it's all, I mean, in a way, all books and all poets, poems, all together in a chronological way, perhaps usually, but uh, are all just one long poem. I mean, I'm not the first to say that. W.B. Yeats said that, you know. Mm. Um, but um, for sure. Um, but the sock mystery. Mm. I, you know, we all have problems with socks. I mean, even the way I, it, it held me up before I came up, I was looking in the sock drawer to find a matching pair. Right, right. You know? Anyway, this is a poem that came out of that, but there's a bit more to it, but I won't say. The Sock Mystery. There should be an asylum for single socks, lost, dejected, turned in on themselves. The twin sock soulmate doppelganger gone AWOL, on the lamb, slipping through a time-space warp somewhere within the module of the washing machine, or dryer rattling in the cellar's deep space, the one never to be found again, gone, we know not where, to the afterlife of socks, sock tartarus, the Elysium of Argyle, <laughs> the heaven of crew, gold toe, tennis, winter woolly, summer wear. Surely there's no purgatory or hell for socks, even for absconders who walk out on partners, family, before their souls are worn threadbare, their number up. The odd time it happens, these socks get lonely for the earth, and weeks, months later, the prodigals meekly reappear under a bed, cushion, wardrobe, only to discover their partners have disappeared, passed on, unable to make it alone. But how good it is to see socks united once more, tucked into each other, close, touching, at one, the deserter promising to stay put, not to take a hike, not to do a runner this time. No greater joy is known than on these occasions. Such dancing, such cavorting, such jubilation in the kingdom of socks. <laughs> <laughs> oh. A friend said to me, um, a very good critic, Terence Brown said, it's a poem about something real. You were joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you, you talk about friends, you have many poems to your friends and, do, yeah. and to the, the great poet, Seamus Haney, who was your, your mentor, right? A mentor or...? Well, I love Seamus. I don't like the word mentor in general. Excuse me, yeah. it's just um, um, because it, 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 too, it puts something in a category and I don't like being right, categorized. Right, yeah. uh, Seamus was a close friend. Uh, I was lucky enough to get to know him. Actually, I got to know him when he came to Burlington and we had a great time and he wrote about it afterwards. Um, and 
he, he, you know, he, he used to even ring on Christmas Day to say Happy Christmas and um, mm. over the years. So, and he, I think perhaps when I, I, we liked to have a drink together and stuff, and I don't think that he had many of his own crowd. A lot of them were gone, you know, so he liked when I went to Ireland or when they came here to be able to relax and, you know, talk about the, 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 the well, poetry and all poetry, it was basically, and, and, and also talk about some of the things in the poetry world that maybe we're better off not other people to hear them. <laughs> Do you understand? Okay. Uh, yeah. We sort of... It's a kind of difficult kind of world, really, but it means great world, and we're, we were both lucky. And I was lucky enough to know him, and I was lucky enough to be in his company, and he helped a lot of people, not just me, but his... his he had a beautiful... He was a beautiful man, really, yeah. apart from the poems and the writing, the prose. Um, so he came here twice, mm. and then he came to stayed in the house a few times with Mary, his wife, and uh, I used to stay in Dublin when I went there. But uh, I don't know why I. Uh, there is a poem here. Um, oh. Oh, oh, yeah, he dedicated. I, t I gave you a book actually a while yes. ago of Human Chain, which was his last book while he was alive, and he does a poem in it to me to Gregory of Corcus, which is a poem which is a character in the Greek anthology, which are all supposed to be translations, but they're all myself, and we used to joke. So there's a lot of different characters, and it's supposed to be a new phone book of the Greek anthology, which there's 16 now, but I call this one Greek anthology book 17. And I read that, actually. Um, but he, 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 in his last book, um, as I say, published, he, um, he dedicated a poem to Gregory of Carcass, who was Sweeney, actually. And Mad, there was a Sweeney poem, and Mad Sweeney was kind of the mad poet. Um, I meant, <laughs> I, I, I've actually had two poems dedicated to me, uh, and in both cases, I'm Sweeney. Um, it's beginning to worry me, like, really, <laughs> was there <laughs> something? But uh, we, I talked about it, we laughed. He said he, he, he dedicated it because of, because um, uh, my own Greek poems were kind of characters, like Sweeney, I suppose, sometimes, you know. Um, anyway, um, no, we, we have to find it. But there's a poem in here by a so-called Henius. Yes, you got to go to that, yeah. you know. Um, but I, I hope I can. Uh, excuse me. Um, what is the name of the poem you're looking for? There's two of them actually. Um, sorry. We sh Nope, I can't. It's, it's evading me right now. Um, Would it be. What is, oh, here I have it. Concealment, I have it. Okay, great. This is set in Greece when I was there, and um, there's a few references. Morrisville, but of course we know Morrisville here. Derinan is where I love to go, and, and, and Tomb is where. Seamus was, uh, and in Delphi, of course. Mm. Uh, and also there's an allusion to the end to his own bog poems where the butter was found and so forth. And um, Anyway, concealment by supposedly Henius. <laughs> a man walked past. We practically brushed shoulders. The lane was so narrow. I nodded, muttered a calamara. But he chose to look ahead, ignore me. I've seen that look that demeanour before. Always in rural towns, villages, Tomb, Morrisville, Derinan, Delphi. Not simply the buttoned up look that is the result of living in a small community, but the face that stubbornly shuts out the invasion of sightseers, yuppie realtors, outsiders. It conceals the gold bar of butter, rancid or no, left buried in the bog, safe from any museum, the last salted treasure of the lost world. Mm. Um, Could you read Blues for us? Sure. The, and one of the, uh, the, un, uh, <coughs> the poems, not in, uh, the uncollected poems. Sure. Um, it's a sonnet uh, written a while ago, but then redrafted recently. Um, I see two... African American black um, students outside, uh, Ty Prince and Manny, and um, 
I, it, I recall in Irish, the word for our black person is blue, far Oh, okay. Blue. They're, they don't, in Ireland, the Irish language does not call a person black. It's blue. Mm -hmm. So I, the poem came out of that then, really. Okay. Also came out of a time when there was a lot of, well, there is a lot of racism, but there was a lot of um, stuff going on in the South, and then, of course, our present president and so forth. Mm. Um, blues. There's a brilliant but intangible lazulite blue, you must have seen it, glistening of fresh snow, something akin but not quite the same as you see shine off the back of a barn swallow, the star and moon blinged night sky, the neck of the male mallard, the halo of a gas stove flame, a certain neon butterfly or the back of a blue bottle fly. This ineffable glow I noticed again, seeing students, both on white, many and Thai prints, shimmering blue light as they high-fived by the international garden outside my office. I didn't cotton on till then why in the Irish language a black brother and sister are called blue. Oh, my beautiful blue sister and brother. There you are. And one, well, do you, can you do one more? Sure. At least, and which, which poem do you want to do for, the, for our C Can I here? finish with two? Of course, yes. Um, uh, one called, pay, uh, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I gave up my car and I, I'm, my house is fast, fossil fuel, no gas, no oil, mm. um, heat pump and solar. Um, but, um, uh, and I've gone to Standing Rock and, and, uh, and maybe be going to Nebraska next now because of the, the pipe that mm. it's back on schedule. Um, uh, and did civil disobedience with Bill McKibben and other people outside the White House and got arrested. Mm. It's important in my life. The poem, it's a life. The poems are my life, but I am true to my life, so the poems can be true to, to, to poetry. Yeah. Um, so it's all connected, really. It's all a kind of a palindrome, really, one's life. Uh, uh, the writing and the... the um, and, the, and the life. Mm. Excuse me. Um, pa patient. Short little poem. Okay. 169. The snow has melted clean off the mountain. It's winter still. Yet another indication that Gaia is in trouble. The things aren't sound. The rocky mountaintop shines like the bald head of a woman after chemo who wills herself out of her hospital bed to take in the trees, the squirrels, the commotion around town, sip bear in a dive, smile at the child ogling her shiny head, wishing it didn't take all this dying to love life. Um, maybe we should leave it at that. Uh, would you like me to read another one? Or what would you like? Well, you said two, if okay. you wanted another no, one. No, no, I don't mind. I, I mean, uh, I, I just, I'll do what you want me to do, but I think, we're, are we out of time? No, it's not the time. It's what you want to, uh, well, to well, well, I'll go on. If it's you want to finish with Patient, that last beautiful poem, amazing poem, or uh, Canticle uh, of the Sun. Yes. Or Hellboxer. A bit too long, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, the Canticle of the Sun. I'm actually going to finish with, I'm going to add to another one. So okay. Excuse me, and then you can just get rid of them when you, when you edit. Umbilical, and then the Canticle of the Sun is a more powerful and positive poem, perhaps. Umbilical is a, sh is a sonnet um, addressing really myself. 
You bike most everywhere these days, weary of your part in the latest war, the slaughter of innocents, the various wily ways you've grown used to, complicity's feather. The gas pump is an umbilical cord sucking the life out of exhausted terra matter. You read about leaders ready to award the future and mammon her body, smother her in her own fumes. You know the reward, the fate of those who killed their mothers. Remember Orestes you translated to humankind. Down swoop the Irenes, the avenging daughters, driving tormented Orestes out of his mind. No escaping the furies now, the ever so kind. And I'll finish up with Canticle of the Sun, which is a kind of, a, as I say, a secular take of, um, of uh, Francis of Assisi's Canticle of the Sun. Um, I start with chalk it down. That's a number of an Irish saying. It's like saying, that's it, like, that's, that's it, that's it. Chalk it down, that's, that's going to happen, that's for sure. Do you understand? Mm, I, okay. I think, I, I think you hear, some people use it here, but I, certainly my students who I've asked don't, don't know it. Right, right. I'm glad you, you told it what, what it means. But uh, okay, when, so I'm this. going to say thank you, and we're going to, to end with your saying chalk it down, okay? Sure. And so, so thank you so much for being my guest again. Thank you. And, uh, and for this beautiful book, Select Atlante and this beautiful work of art and poetry and solace and enlightenment. Thank you so much and come back again. And I would love to and thank you, Margaret, for all you do and also um, Kevin um, and also the, the library here, Barbara down in the library, is doing a night for the book on February 16th at 7 o'clock. Okay. in the Fletcher and anybody's welcome. I'll give a small reading and um, oh, short wonderful. reading and so forth and there'll be wine and they'll make an occasion out oh. of it. What date is that, February? February 16th, seven, it's a Friday at 7 p.m. Okay, Fletcher. In the library. Anybody's welcome. Okay, wonderful. wonderful. Um, Canticle of the Sun, a secular take with apologies to Francis of Assisi. <laughs> Chalk it down, never so much as now should we praise the Maker. First, let us praise Brother Son. He is the light that alights out of every night. He is the radiant first offspring of the One. Next, let us praise Sister Moon and all the stars like manna showering down from the heavens. Let us pray whether himself the twins, air and wind, cloud and sky, who sustain all creatures. What about their sibling, water? She is so humble, she's hardly noticed. We'd be nothing without her. Likewise, our, our friend, fire. And Lord Mother Earth, carrying her basket overflowing with sundry victuals to feed all her offspring, the ant, cow, rat, bee, vulture, bird of paradise, crow, whale, camel, rainbow trout, all our close relatives. Applaud also those who work for her sake, especially now we need them more than ever. They know we have so little time that we've made our mother ill. Praise those who say there is hope still and those who struggle for peace peacefully. They'll be crowned in the Maker's goodness before the end, which is always now and without end. We could go on, but let us finish by praising Father Death, for he is of the Creator. Those who do not honour him bring him on us before our time. Yet those who struggle for our mother know another life. May they thrive. Yea, I say, chalk it down. <laughs>